Hello. My name is Ryan Stone. I've been a committer with the FreeBSD project for about 10 years now. And thank you for attending my talk, where I will be discussing my work bringing eBPF into FreeBSD and how I've combined that with Capsicum to perform what's known as oblivious sandboxing. So first, let's discuss the problem. FreeBSD has been very successful in converting base system utilities to run within a Capsicum sandbox, but we've been far less successful at converting large third-party applications. We're talking things like Apache, Chrome, uh, Bind, those types of uh, large third-party applications. And the difficulty is sort of twofold. The code bases for these projects are far too large. FreeBSD cannot possibly maintain a separate Capsicum-enabled fork. But those projects are not able to take FreeBSD-specific patches in order to add Capsicum support. So we're sort of at an impasse. So the problem, or the, the problem we're going to try to solve is how can we run these third-party binaries in a Capsicum sandbox without modifying their source code? So let's just dig a little deeper into what we might call the Capsicum problem. On the left-hand side of the slide, I show some sample code. We fork, we exec some executable, and the parent waits for the child to complete. In order to successfully run this in a Capsicum sandbox, it requires pretty extensive modifications. First, we have to pre-open the executable that we want to run. Uh, then we can cap enter to enter our sandbox. And then later on in the code, at the point where we wanted to uh, actually execute it, at that point, we have to PD fork instead of fork. Uh, we can no longer call exec, of course, because exec is accessing a global path and we're not allowed to access global namespaces in Capsicum mode. So we have to change the exec into an F exec. And finally, the parent would have to either PD wait, which actually hasn't been upstreamed yet, or some equivalent syscall that waits on the process, to, on the child process to complete, because wait for is no longer accessible because again, the PID namespace is a global namespace. So you start to get the idea of how extensive these patches can be, and it's quite invasive. And a large portable third-party project can't really take a patch that adds FreeBSD-specific syscalls like PD fork or even something like FXEC, which is in a syscall in Linux uh, and subsequently significantly more expensive than just exec. Uh, none of these are acceptable to these third-party projects. And even just the restructuring of pre-opening file descriptors and using them later is fairly invasive and uh, difficult to get an upstream project to accept. We, so the only cases like TCP dump where we've really been able to do it is cases where the original structure of the code was such that it wasn't that invasive, but that hasn't been the case for most projects. But a couple years back, there was a very interesting BSD CAN talk given by Jonathan Anderson about oblivious sandboxing in Capsicum. And the goal here is to take existing binaries that have absolutely no Capsicum modifications to them whatsoever, start them in cap mode from the beginning and successfully run them. And the way this is achieved is by replacing the implementations of syscalls that Capsicum won't give you access to with versions that act on pre-allocated resources, generally file descriptors. So I give an example here of a replacement for open. Open again is acting on the global namespace, the, 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 path, the path namespace. <clears throat> so that's not allowed. But what this replacement does is it looks up the path in a pre, some kind of pre-existing dictionary of resources we already have open, uh, 
to find its parent directory file descriptor and also give us the, the base name of the path, the path with the directory taken off. And we can use that combo of the directory file descriptor and the base name as an argument to open at. And this gets us the exact same semantics as the original open syscall, but in a capsicum friendly way. And the most important thing to understand about this is that we have not loosened the restrictions of capsicum at all. We still have the full protections. The only difference is that we're uh, emulating the operation of these syscalls that act on global namespaces, but we emulate them in terms of operations on capabilities like our directory fault descriptor. So that, that was pretty cool. I really enjoyed that talk. Uh, but I had a use case where I wanted to sandbox Clang. And at the time, Clang was a statically linked binary in FreeBSD. And so this was a problem. The, the way that this worked was it was a shared library that was injected into the process's address space by the runtime linker as it first started. So it would only work for dynamically linked applications and would not work for Clang, which was statically linked. So I wanted to investigate, was there another way I could intercept and change the behavior of the system calls without involving the runtime linker? So enter eBPF. eBPF is an in-kernel bytecode that came from Linux. And it's a verified bytecode. So what that means is when you load a bytecode program into the Linux kernel, the kernel will run it through a verifier that proves that, it, that the code is free of any bad behavior. Stuff like you know, null pointer references, array index out of bounds, infinite loops, accessing arbitrary pointers. None of that is allowed by the verifier. If you don't follow those rules, the verifier will just refuse to load your program. And then you can take these bytecode programs and attach them to statically defined hooks in the Linux kernel. So I think the best analogy to, in, to FreeBSD functionality would be the firewalls. In FreeBSD, we have many firewall implementations you can use. We have IPFW, we have PF, and we have IP filter. And you can load one or more of these firewalls as loadable kernel modules. And then we have hooks in our packet input and output paths. Every packet that passes by this hook is passed to the firewall where it can run its rules and inform the kernel whether the packet should be dropped, allowed, redirected, rewritten. There's all kinds of things that can be done by a firewall. And so eBPF bytecode programs in Linux are similar. You have hooks at various interesting places in the kernel and a protocol by which when these hooks are activated by an event, the bytecode program is invoked with information about the event, and the bytecode program can inform the kernel what to do next. And this allows, it's a very powerful mechanism for extending the functionality of the Linux kernel in all kinds of interesting ways, but in ways that are significantly safer and less error prone and easier than writing loadable kernel modules in C where you can have all those bugs, you can have infinite loops or index out of bounds, there's all kinds of terrible things that can happen in C that eBPF and its verifier will prevent. Uh, another analogy to functionality in FreeBSD would be in Dtrace. In Dtrace, we have a number of static probes in the kernel, whether it's function boundaries or probes that are explicitly added, like the 
scheduler probes or the net probes. And again, when that event happens, the probe fires and you can have a details program attached to a probe that will have code run with information about that event. Now, the difference is that in DTrace, that is basically only a read-only operation. It's for introspection. Whereas eBPF can, in a limited manner, change the behavior of the kernel. Uh, so to make all this possible or to make interesting functionality possible, there are helper functions to find that are written in C in the kernel that are callable from bytecode programs. A good example of this are the helper functions used to implement maps. Maps are global data structures within a set of eBPF programs. Uh, they're simple key value stores, nothing too complicated. Uh, there's a number of different types like hash tables or arrays, uh, longest prefix match tries, and a whole lot of very specialized data structures. And you can do all kinds of things with these maps. You can pass data from kernel to user land or user, from user land to kernel. And by kernel, I mean from an eBPF program running in kernel to user land or from user land to a one or more eBPF programs. Uh, this data is persistent between different invocations of a bytecode program. Whereas that's it's the only form of state state tracking that you have in eBPF. Other than that, you just have a stack which is wiped clean after every invocation. And the one the last piece that makes this such an interesting technology is that LLVM can output eBPF object files. So you can compile a C program or even a C++ program down to eBPF bytecode with the caveat that LLVM, it's impossible to statically prove properties of a C program like it doesn't do reference null, or maybe not impossible per se, uh, but very difficult and LLVM doesn't even try. So it's entirely possible to write C code that compiles down to eBPF bytecode, but that bytecode isn't loaded or is not loadable by the verifier. So as the author of the C code, you're responsible for ensuring that your code will pass the verifier. So putting this together, I have added an eBPF hook into the syscall path and I will allow bytecode programs to intercept particular system calls made by chosen processes. And then I'll add helper functions to my eBPF VM that give access to capsicum friendly functionality, stuff like open at and all the other at functions, syscalls like uh, real path at, so on and so forth, PD fork, and some other kernel functionality. Now, it's important to remember that while I've named these the same as existing functions, because their functionality is virtually identical. The functionality does vary slightly between the helper function and the original function they emulate. And uh, I'll talk about what those, what those differences are as I, as I walk through some uh, examples. With these two pieces of infrastructure, I can start writing eBPF programs in C that will intercept illegal syscalls, syscalls that Capscom won't let you have, and re-implement them in terms of legal ops. I call this interception and re-implementation as rewriting a syscall. And this will allow me to rewrite any syscall made by any binary, no matter what its ABI, whether it's statically or dynamically linked, I can, I can rewrite any syscall to be capsule legal, and therefore I can run any binary in a capsicum sandbox. So I've written a very small program, which I call cap run, that will run a specified command in a sandbox with access to whatever paths you, 
you want to give it access to. So I give an example. We're going to run a program. It will have read access to files and slash temp. It will have execute access to files and slash lib. And it's just going to run cat on slash temp slash foo. Now, of course, this interface is significantly simplified compared to the granularity provided by Capsicum, but it serves as a good example of, of what is possible. And what CapRun does is it will open these directories that you specify and will load them into an eBPF map so that the eBPF program has access to these <clears throat> file descriptors. It will then load my bytecode programs into the kernel, will fork a child process to run the, the executable. The child process will activate the programs so that for that child process, its own syscall invocations will get rewritten by my programs. And then finally, we can enter our sandbox and fexec the executable we wanted to run. In this case, it would be cat. So I wanted to give, uh, just to take a quick look at what the hook looks like in the syscall path. So this is in the kernel. I would have liked to show this in context, but unfortunately the syscall path is pretty ugly. It's got dtrace hooks, it's got ktrace hooks, it's got audit events, it's got this, it's got that. It's very difficult to show this code in context and have that actually help and understand. So just understand this code is running in the kernel as soon as we have taken a syscall trap from a user land program. And we call a macro to try to fire a probe if, it's, if it is, has a program attached. Uh, and we pass the code which is the, the identifier of the Cisco, whether it's open or read or send or what have you. And then we pass the Cisco arguments. And if the bytecode program returns a special take action return, uh, return value, then that is an indication that the bytecode program that was loaded at this hook has fired and has successfully rewritten the operation of the system call. So we don't have to perform the system call. We just grab the air no and skip the system call and return back to user land. And then now with all that background, we can start walking through a code example of one of my rewriters. I don't intend this talk to be walking through the code of every writer that would get both very dry and uh, there's a lot of detail. So I, but I think it's instructive to walk through one code example. And then with that in mind, we can start taking things from a higher level and walking through the, the higher level uh, steps that are, that the rewriters have to walk through without getting into the nitty gritty of the code. But anyway, we have this the CBPF bytecode program, which is, and they call it a program, but that's just eBPF's way of saying it's a function. It gets past the syscall arguments as its single argument. And as we can guess from the name, this is being used to intercept the open syscall and rewrite it. So I declare a buffer. I'm going to store a file name in that buffer. Uh, if you want to object that 64 bytes is too small for a path name, you're right. We will fix that. But for the sake of the example, a static buffer is the easiest thing at this point. So because this bytecode program is running in the context of the kernel, we can't directly access the path that was passed as an argument to open. We have to copy that into our kernel buffer. So I have an EPPF bytecode program, copy and stir, that duplicates the functionality of the kernel interface of the same name. If that gets an error, 
I return the magic action return value to say, okay, the syscall is complete. They gave us a bogus path. path uh, just return that error to them. And the copy and stir helper function that I've defined here has set up the error no value for me. Uh, just so that I don't have to tediously take the error, or set the return code every time that uh, a rewrite error, a rewriter program hits hits the exact same error. It's it's just less error prone to have copy and start do it for me. So that's why there's no explicit setting of an error note here. And then we can move on to the second half. So I mentioned we would have a map for containing our directory file descriptors. So we can see I've defined one. It's, it's defined with this magic global macro that just tells the LLVM compiler uh, or Clang how, uh, how to make, how to define, how to define this. Uh, it's a hash table and it's a hash table from buffers of size, max path length. So these are path names to ints, file descriptors. So in the, in the rewriter, having copied in the path into our buffer, we need to perform a path-based longest prefix match in our map to find a directory file descriptor that contains the path that we are trying to open. So I've added a helper function ebpf map path lookup that does exactly that. It will basically keep chopping off the path, calling dir name on the path at each step until it finds a match. And then it will return the directory file descriptor or a pointer to it if that was successful. And we'll also change the path pointer to point to the unused portion of the path. This is the exact equivalent of the hypothetical lookup FD function that we saw in the shared library based example a few slides back. Now, of course, this could fail. They could have opened a path that we didn't grant access to. In that case, I return the special action continue return value which indicates to the syscall path to run, to attempt to run the syscall as normal. Now, in this case, because this is open, that's just going to fail with ECAP mode, but I feel that that's the least confusing and easiest debug way is that if the caps are commonized or the, the, the binary that's running within the sandbox uh, has violated the bounds of the sandbox, just do what we normally do and return ECAP mode. But if we succeeded, then we can call open at with our directory file descriptor and the path as arguments, along with the original flags and modes that were specified in the arguments. And again, open at being a helper function, it has already set up things like the, re the, the file descriptor return value and setting Erno if necessary all that, so we don't have to tediously do that in every single rewriter. And then finally, whether OpenNet succeeded or failed, we just need to return that result to the usual end program. So we take the return action. And that's it. Now our binary can, our binary can call open and that will invoke this bytecode program and open will be faithfully emulated. Now, as I mentioned, <clears throat> my buffer was too small. It was only 64 bytes. A path could be a 1K, but my the stack size I have available to me is 512 bytes. So I can't just make that big enough. So we can get around that with the use of per CPU maps. We can use that to, as a scratch buffer allocator. Because 
per CPU maps give you key value pairs that are unique per CPU. So my bytecode program can just grab uh, a pre-allocated key value pair out of it and be secure in the knowledge that no other CPU is going to come along and scribble over that buffer and cause some kind of bug. So this, it's a pretty simple modification to the bytecode program to account for this. We define our new scratch map. Uh, it's a per CPU array. So be, being as it's an array, its keys are integers. And then the values need to be max path length in length. Max path length in length. And just to give myself some space for future rewriters that might require more than one scratch buffer, I'll allocate eight of them. So because this is an array uh, map, that means that indexes zero through seven will be pre-populated with buffers of max path len. And because it's a per CPU map, every CPU will get a unique buffer for every all eight indexes. So the modification to the code is pretty simple. I just have to look up in my map for one of my indexes. We'll just take the first one. And then the copy and stir, uh, we can just we just have to pass the correct length of the of the, of the buffer. And one thing to note, I've I vaguely mentioned the verifier before. And the verifier is very clever. The verifier will know that buff was the result of a lookup in this particular scratch map. So it knows that buff size is actually max path length. If I had passed a larger size than what was declared for the map, then it would know that the buffer was too small. So it also has to... The verifier also knows the semantics of copy and stir, and that copy and stir will write to buff and will write up to that length of bytes. So if you pass a combination of buffer and length that doesn't actually match the code, the verifier will catch that, and the verifier will reject the program. So that's sort of the an example of what makes eBPF really exciting for kernel developers because we've eliminated the, the chance of a buffer overflow modulo bugs in the verifier. Now, the cost of this, of course, is that the verifier can be a little fiddly and you have to write your code in such a way that the verifier is actually able to statically prove these properties. So, I just sort of skipped over a detail on all that, though. I said that because it's a per-CPU bu buffer, I can be guaranteed that no other CPU will overwrite that buffer, which was true. But what I haven't guaranteed is that I won't get preempted halfway through running my bytecode program and that another thread will come in and overwrite that buffer on me. Running on the same CPU. So traditionally in the FreeBSD kernel, if you had per CPU state, you would protect it by critical enter, which prevents preemption. But this bytecode program, it's calling copy in, it's calling open at, it's doing IO. It could be hitting NFS and blocking for a second on a slow NFS server. We can't do it. We cannot block like that inside of a critical section in the kernel. And if we just try to remove the critical section, then we're open to preemption. So we take the approach that all computer scientists take when their abstractions don't actually match up with reality. And they cheat. And they redefine the abstraction slightly such that 
we can maintain the original interface that the user expected without actually, in this case, providing per CPU operations. So the approach I've taken for my prototype is before I enter the eBPF program, I'll record the current CPU index and I'll acquire an SX lock for that CPU. And then whenever you do any type of per CPU lookup, like I'm an operation on a per CPU map in your bytecode program, I will act on state for that cache CPU, even if you have been preempted or otherwise migrated to a different CPU. So in this way, we allow multi-threaded accesses to these per CPU maps, which is what we wanted, but we also guarantee that no thread can have its state corrupted by a different eBPF program, which is the other invariant we require. The cost, of course, is that if a eBPF program does block and, or and sleep on I.O., any other thread attempting to execute an eBPF program on that same CPU is going to have to block and wait for the original one to complete and release the CPU. So if you wanted to scale this to you know thousands of threads doing I.O. in Apache or something, it's probably not going to work out that very well. You would have to come up with another scheme that was probably some kind of hashing scheme. But for the purposes of the prototype, this is sufficient. Another problem that we can run into is symlink resolution in the sandbox. So supposing I have granted access to both slash lib and slash user lib. And supposing my program attempts to open slash user slash lib slash libthr.so. As it happens, that is not a file, it's a symlink, and a symlink to slash lib slash libthr.so.3. So what happens with the rewriter as we've currently defined it is we'll look up the user provided path slash user lib libthr. And we will locate the directory file descriptor for that path. So we'll get the directory file descriptor for slash user lib and attempt to open at libthr. And that will fail because Capsicum will see that that was a symlink to a file that is located outside of the bounds of the directory file descriptor. And that is not allowed in cap mode because it's horribly unsafe. You could just create a symlink pointing to any file you liked on the file system and just open or write to it or whatever. So we have to work around this. And the only way we can do this is by manually resolving the symlink in the bytecode program ourselves. The rewriter has to check every component of the path, user, Slash user, are you a symlink? No. Okay, slash lib, are you a symlink? No. Okay, libthr.so, are you a symlink? Oh, yes. What are you a symlink to? Okay, now we start again. Slash lib, are you a symlink? No. Slash libthr.so.3, are you a symlink? No. Okay, at that point, we're good. We can do our open at with slash lib, slash libthr.so. But having established all this, any system call that acts on paths, on, on global path, on like absolute paths, not, not relative paths in the ads like OpenAt does, but any link that act, any system call that acts on, on paths can be converted to their at variant with basically exactly the same pro, pro, uh, process. Copying the path, Resolve symlinks in that path, look up the directory file descriptor, and split it into you know the directory file descriptor part and the remaining part of the path, and then use the stat at or read link at or what have you at syscall to emulate the original behavior of the syscall that we're rewriting. And I give 
a short list, and that's not that's not even all. There's all kinds of uh, of of syscalls that I have in, written rewriters for that all basically do exactly the same thing. But paths are not the only global namespace in FreeBSD. The PID namespace is another one. So rewriting and emulating fork, that's relatively easy. We can convert it to PD fork and return the PID. But wait on a PID, again, accessing the global namespace, not allowed. So we need a map defined in our programs that will map a PID back to a process descriptor because PD fork gives us both. So fork can save this mapping and then wait for can look up the process descriptor given the PID that was passed to the syscall and then pass that to PD wait for. And then if they call wait for with negative one as the PID indicating it's a wildcard match, any child process, well, that gets even more complicated and it's not in the scope of this talk. I'm going to skip this slide for the sake of time, but even that procedure I just discussed wasn't enough. There's actually a deadlock, which I describe and how I describe how I resolve it here. But I did want to do a demo of my work. <clears throat> so I can, for instance, try to cap, cap run slash rescue slash cat is a statically linked version of cat. Uh, and as we see, if I attempt to just run cat on etcfs tab, cat gets not permitted in capability mode. You tried to open a file and didn't have access to it. So now I can grant read access to slash etsy, and now this succeeds. And we can try the same thing with bin cat, the dynamically linked version of cat. But as we can see, the runtime linker hits the exact same problem. It tried to open libc and failed. So it thinks it doesn't exist. So we can fix that. We can give access to slash lib. Oh, but that wasn't good enough either. I gave read access to lib. And now uh, RTLD has found libc, but when it tried to mmap it, that file descriptor didn't have the mmap with execute permissions uh, uh, capability set, so we failed with capabilities insufficient. So we'll grant execute access. And now, again, uh, bin cat can succeed. So an interesting thing to note here is that I, unlike the shared library-based version, which had to make pretty extensive changes to the runtime linker in order to make it work because it had the same problem. It tries to open files and that's not allowed in the capsicum sandbox because I'm intercepting open at the syscall layer in the kernel, RTLD works as normal as long as I have granted access to files, to, the, to slash lib or wherever else it's trying to load libraries from. So my one final example is I have an evil tar file. So I have a file uh, temp target, which I will have hello in. But I have an evil tar file. And if I try to open it with a modern version of tar, it will fail. Or sorry, if I try to extract it with a modern version of tar, it will fail. Uh, it tried to create this evil sim link that pointed outside of the current directory and tar won't let you do that. But I have an old version of tar that is vulnerable. I call that vtar. And if I try to extract this evil tar file, it succeeds. And as we can see, my, my target file here got overwritten by this evil tar file. 
even though it was outside of the bounds of the directory I was trying to extract to. Uh, but I have a wrapper for tar that again uses my uh, capability uh, capsicum sandboxing mechanism and this will actually parse the arguments to tar so I don't have to manually set what you should give access to and so if I do that uh, the vulnerable version of tar attempted to create the evil symlink pointing outside of the bounds of the current directory, but Capsicum caused that to fail. And thus demonstrating how Capsicum, along with my eBPF programs, is able to protect us from uh, vulnerabilities in, in third-party applications. This was a real published... Uh, a vulnerability in libarchive that we are now protected from. So having implemented this, uh, just a quick comparison with libpreopen, I'm running short on time. eBPF has mentioned candle, any binary libpreopen is limited to shared binaries, uh, runtime linked binaries. And Linux binaries are pretty tricky because they're limited to the Linux syscalls, you don't have access to important things like PD fork. EBPF can only intercept system calls, uh, whereas libpreopen can intercept anything because it's it's acting at the usual land boundary. The most important difference I would say though is that the main disadvantage of my approach is we have this huge in-kernel infrastructure we've added that is attackable by evil code that is uh, exploited a vulnerability in our sandbox code. The library-based approach does not have this new attack surface. It's, it's library code running with the same uh, same rights as the executable, so you're not really adding any new attack surface. And then there was this minor thing that I, I have found with libpreopen. If I intercept open, then calls to explicitly to open from a binary get intercepted. If the binary calls f open, the standard IO function, which is implemented in libc, it doesn't get it. It it goes to tries to call the original syscall. And then you can override underscore open and that catches the f open call. Is that intended behavior? Is that an accident of how our runtime linker currently functions? This isn't an unsolvable problem. This is Somebody needs to define the semantics of how we would override uh, system calls through a library and, and formalize that and implement it. But it is an open, an open problem for the library-based version. And finally, I'll quickly go over the overall status of bringing eBPF into FreeBSD. We have a just-in-time compiler in uh, progress. There is a Google Summer of Code project. Uh, going on right now to implement XTP hooks. XTP hooks are a Linux a, a Linux Linux functionality that has uh, it's basically you the, the main use case is DDoS prevention. It allows you to filter packets with as little overhead as possible, uh, which is very useful for as I say DDoS. They, they also have more advanced capabilities that let you redirect packets uh, that we may not get out of this project, but this is at least a very good start. And then I've pointed at the two repos where this code lives. Uh, so with that, my uh, time is up. I will now hand it off to Dan and uh, myself for the uh, live question and answer session. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. I hope it was interesting. I hope it was informative. And... Yeah, goodbye.